All right, we're here with uh, Greg Dirkerson out of Virginia, and I have my co-host, Frank Spaulding. Um, we're going to cover commercial, real estate, contracting. Who, know, who knows what we're going to cover today? I like, I like free-flowing because I like having a conversation, and I like answering, I like asking questions I want to know. That's the beauty about this. So, um, Greg, can you tell us a little bit about your background as far as who you are, what you've done? Kind of give us that hierarchy, because I like, I like painting a good picture as far as so people understand who you are and where you come from, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm a serial entrepreneur, real estate investor and developer. I started uh, full time as an entrepreneur in 1997. Started a little remodeling handyman company. Didn't go to college. I went in the Navy right out of high school. And after I got out of the Navy, worked a couple of jobs. But in 1997 was when I began my full time entrepreneurial journey. I left the W-2 world for good and uh, started a little remodeling handyman company. Did 250000 in revenue the first year, just me, my truck and tools. Built that into a $30 million building company in seven years, started 12 other companies along the way, built them all up, sold them all off, reinvested all the profits uh, into other assets, learned how to become a real estate developer. So I started doing um, spec houses, then I got into subdivisions and I got into commercial development and just kind of scaled everything from there. And uh, I've been an investor ever since. So I invest in companies, I invest in real estate, I invest in stocks, cryptos, just, you know, I'm just a serial entrepreneur, opportunistic investor looking for value anywhere I can find it. So that's, that's kind of me in a nutshell. Man, that is, that is such a huge, like, I wouldn't even call it a resume because like, that's an employee talk. <laughs> I, 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 forget, I don't even know the word you call that, but that's amazing. I think we have to do another one just off of that because I'm- Yeah, it's, it's resume, you know, so in our world, you know, we, we just call it a, you know, resume, investment portfolio, you know, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, it's, you know, I've done a lot of different things. You know, but there's a common thread to everything. Number one, you know, even though I didn't go to college, I, I went in the Navy and took some classes in the Navy. I did retail. So we ran all the ship stores and barber shops and laundry and things like that. So it was retail is what I did in the Navy. So I learned accounting and be basic business there. Then when I got out, I worked in restaurants and construction. I always had a side business. But the biggest thing was I was always developing myself, always pouring into myself, reading self you know, development books, professional development, investing books, real estate stocks, you know, all kinds of different things along the way. And, you know, but more importantly, I was taking action on what I was learning. So the first book that I read that was transformative to me was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I'm sure you've read it. You know, almost everybody in, in the game has read it. When I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, so I'll just ask you, when you read that book, what did you get out of it? What was your big takeaway from Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Um, for me, it was... Uh... It was that I didn't have to conform to everybody else. I can do my own thing because he kind of talked about his rich dad, how his rich dad did certain things a certain way. And then his poor dad did certain things like everybody else. So it was like it kind of opened your eyes to like, hey, I can do, I can be different and excel at it. Frank, what about you? For me, it was more of an affirmation that everything I was doing was correct. Uh, I was in the junior achievement in school and grew up in a family of business owners uh, so, you know, it was get out there and do for oneself. Uh, I felt all of a sudden a lot less bad about getting fired from every job I'd had up to that point, uh, typically within 30 days or less, because I would get in there and, you know, I think, and I, you know, I see ways to do things better. And, uh, you know, the big, uh, corporations, they're not going to change. So then, you know, small mom and pop type places, surely they'll see the value in what I'm offering. And that still just didn't work. So uh, I'm just going off and on my own. And then, you know, just, you know, learning that real estate was an option. Uh, and it suddenly validated all of the uh, purchases I'd made from the uh, late night infomercials for all the get rich quick schemes uh, in real estate. You know, back in the day, Dave Del Dotto and Carlton Sheets and uh, John Alexander way back in the day, stuff like that. So yeah, yeah. So you're, you know, that's the trait of an entrepreneur, right? You're unemployable, you know, so that's me. I, you know, I'm not a good employee, so I carved my own path. But so my, I didn't come from a family of entrepreneurs, business people. My dad was career military. And then after that, civil service, you know, which is a job working for the government. Um, yeah. And then my mom was career with Blue Cross Blue Shield, started as a secretary and, you know, was in sales and, and was a government rep, you know, after that, just a regular middle class type, you know, uh, family up, upbringing. And, you know, so neither one of them, you know, were entrepreneurs, but what my dad taught me when I was young, and I'm a natural born entrepreneur, when I was young, if I wanted something, he wouldn't give me the money. He would say, well, you go, you go figure out how to pay for it. You go earn money. And 
Mm -hmm. I was like, well, how do I do that? He said, go knock on the door and see if they need anything done. So that's what I did. So I would go to my neighbor's house and knock on the door. Boom, boom, boom. My name is Greg. I live down the street. I need 20 bucks for my next martial art testing so I can pay for the, the test and buy the belt if I get it. And, uh, you know, I'll cut your grass. I'll rake your yard. I'll wash your car, walk your dog, babysit your kids. What do you, I need to make some money. What can I do? You know, that was me. And I wouldn't leave till you hired me for something. So, you know, I, I'd be, I was being, you know, making a hundred bucks a week when I was 10 years old, 12 years old, doing that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, fast forward into what I was talking about with Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So when I read that book, I already knew the entrepreneurial thing. That's what I wanted to be. I wanted to carve my own path. I knew the difference between an employee, between being self-employed and between, you know, being an, an owner of a business and an entrepreneur, right? A lot of business owners are just self-employed. They just basically own their own job. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew that I wanted to be, you know, the investor. I wanted to be the entrepreneur. So I wanted to be Rich Dad, right? A lot of people read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and they want to be Robert Kiyosaki. They want to get into real estate. I wanted to be Rich Dad. That was the guy that owned everything, that was mentoring everybody, and that everybody came to with opportunities and, you know, when they needed help. And I'm just wired that way. I love to help people. I love to coach people. I coach and mentor people all over the world doing all kinds of different things. And when I read that book, that hit me. I'm like, I want to be Rich Dad. So that's what I did. I went out just like Rich Dad. I built a bunch of businesses that generated cash flow to invest in other assets that would pay for the things that I wanted out of life and I wanted to do in life. So that's what I've done ever since. And it's just the classic story of the little green houses into the red hotels. And that's just what I've done. And um, it's been, it really was that simple, but the key was I had to get out, I had to do it, I had to take action. And, you know, I had to be confident that I could do it. And I learned along the way, the hard way, you know, again, I'm self-educated. Um, you know, I took, uh, read a lot of books, took a lot of courses, went to a lot of seminars and I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on my education, but not in a formal institution. So uh, it's been, it's been a journey. And then, you know, I've spent millions, you know, making mistakes. Uh, along the way as well that that have been the best educators you know of all so that's me in a nutshell so i have a great question so with you you being overnight successful for the past 24 years <laughs> um how this is a great question for you because you've transitioned and ebbed and flowed in the up and down markets because you've probably been through two heavy transitions how do you how do you find the right time to pivot and what do you pivot into as far as like, how, how do you make that? How's that process look for you? Because you Yeah, so, you know, 2008, nine 2009 was the big one, right? So that's that's when the first big um, recession, almost a depression that I went through when the real estate market crashed and I had to pivot. So I was a builder. Uh, back then I had a building company. I had to shut it down. There was no work. You know, in my area, anybody who was a residential builder, commercial builder, we went out of business basically overnight. We were just slammed, put out of business. I was in a resort rental area, the Outer Banks of North Carolina, where we were building multi-million dollar beach houses, building commercial developments, things like that in that area. That was my primary area. Then I was doing projects in Virginia as well, because it's kind of right there in that region where I'm from, from DC into the Hampton Roads area. Um, so yeah, I mean, instantly overnight, everything I'd done from 1997 until 2009 stopped. You know, it's like being a surgeon and you lose your hands. So what do you do? So you have to, you know, reevaluate. So, you know, shut the company down. Um, and then I pivoted into doing um, smaller spec houses and hiring other general contractors who were looking for work because it became you know, more efficient and cheaper just to hire other builders to do the work for me because everybody was looking for work. Uh, I was still able to borrow money. I had good, you know, I had assets, I had cash in the bank, so I didn't get wiped out, but I didn't have a business anymore day to day. And I had a real estate license. So I was you know, doing, doing my real estate thing, buying and selling properties and, and things like that. I never really did you know, retail real estate. I had a brokerage at one time and had agents and all that, but, you know, I had to make that transition and reinvent what I was going to do. And then I went and opened some restaurants and did, you know, did that for a while. And, you know, those were, you know, a lot of fun and, and, you know, during that season, but I mean, that's really what you do is you just, you just have to look at what are the opportunities now? What can I do now? And then reevaluate. And I went from building multi-million dollar beach houses to building little beach houses that, were costing less than what the kitchens were costing in the houses I was building, you know, and, and selling them and making, you know, a good chunk of change on them. So it was, it was a really interesting time. Now, do you operate now more kind of sitting back and just contracting out a lot of the work uh, as opposed to working in the business constantly? Are you more focused yeah. on the business now? 
Yeah, ever since then, I moved into the investor role, investor developer role, where I hire, you know, general contractors, architects, engineers, I don't do anything in the house, it's all outsourced, it's all hired out, contracted out, uh, so that, you know, I don't, I'm not locked into anything day to day. Uh, you know, my, my, what I do is I find the opportunities, bring the team together to execute on the, on the opportunity and the idea, and that could be real estate, could be a company. Uh, it could be, you know, any number of things. And, and then I just invest, you know, in stocks and crypto and things like that. So yeah, much you know, more laid back lifestyle. Um, I have my education business, you know, where I'm teaching people entrepreneurship, real estate investing, things like that, kind of building my little school of entrepreneurship. And then, like I said, mentoring people around the country. But yeah, everything is outsourced. Everything is, you know, turnkey. And, you know, I'm, I'm not in the mode of, of building, you know, those types of companies anymore. I've kind of done that. So you've achieved your rich dad dream. Yeah, I did what I wanted to do. You know, it's been a journey. It's been 20 something years. And, you know, you get to a point to where, you know, I like doing deals. I like staying active, but those things aren't as important to me as other things at this point in my life, which is impact. You know, I'm, I'm after impact, trying to help share what I've learned, what I know and help other people, you know, do what I've done. And it's, you know, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot more fulfilling than, than any deal you can do. And I've done it my entire career all the businesses I've been involved in, I did them through other people. So I really stepped out of the day-to-day -day of running a company in 0405. You know, that was the last day-to-day -day that I really operated a company. I had people in position that were either partners or they worked for me that ran the actual companies. So, you know, I've been kind of operating that, that way, um, you know, ever since 2004, 2005. So um, I, I heard a podcast, it's probably an older podcast, but you said that um, your team was just you and a secretary or like an admin. Is that still the current status for you right now? You still run really lean? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's just kind of all it's been. You know, I had a chief financial officer full time at one point, but I don't even need that anymore. I just use accountants and, you know, outsource any of the higher level stuff that I need with other professionals. But yeah, yeah, it's just lean, just me and administrative support. And that's it. That's awesome. I, I, uh, I, I really like the impact because I think, I think a lot of people overlook that because the, the money comes and goes as it gets spent. Like once you get the money, it's not really a, th a thing. Like for me, doing the whole podcasting is, is making a larger impact because you don't know the impact can be, can outlive you. You don't know exactly what impact you're going to make because you're making such a big impact, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing that I learned a long time ago that, that really transformed my life, you know, all it takes is one idea. One idea, and that can come from anything. It can come from a book, a, a, you know, a podcast, a YouTube uh, video, a course, a seminar. You know, a lot of times you'll go take a three-day seminar and, you, and there's one thing along that three days that hits you that really resonates that just completely transforms your life or your business. I've had that happen to me multiple times. And that happens with all of my, you know, people that I work with, all my clients and all the businesses I've been in all the time. So that to me is what's really fun and what's really cool is you just, you just never know when you put out an episode, what somebody's going to hear that's going to completely change their lives. And, uh, you know, it's fun to hear people that'll email or, you know, send a note or whatever and say, you know, I heard this episode and I did this and it's just completely changed everything I was doing. And I can't thank you enough. And I just, I love that. And then the people I work with, you know, I mean, you can, you can hear them on the videos talking about the things that we've done and, you know, even recently, just working with some people, helping them structure deals and like, man, I, I never even thought about that. That's going to save me millions of dollars. And I'm like, yeah, it's just, you know, all you know is what you know. Yeah. The, the experience talks by itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your experience. Um, I'm actually working a deal in Atlanta that I was going to consult with you with because I'm really, I'm, I'm excited because I've worked in this deal for a long time. And that's actually where I met you a long time ago in my, in my previous two, two years of investing. So I don't know if you remember this, but um, I called you about two deals I found in Atlanta when I was living in Atlanta at the time. And that's how we kind of structured this. So it's kind of cool circling back and like really bringing on the people that, that help get me to where I'm at, even at this point in my life, just to have a conversation again. So yeah, awesome. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. So I, I think, I think you're one of the people that contributed to, to everything that I'm doing now, just because you made me think at a higher level. Um, so I'm, I'm excited. This is, this is a great interview and a great opportunity for hope everybody listening. So let's kind of dive into how, how do you find, cause you, you're, you're, you're a small shop. You kind of outsource everything. How do you find the right people to work with? Is it based off of like, you've been doing this for a long time in all these areas that you already have people, or you kind of have to like 
you can sense or you have like a sixth sense of like, hey, this is going to be the person that I need to hire for the job. Well, I can go into any market anywhere in the world for any business and know whether or not that's the right person for the job, no matter what the job is, just by, you know, a few minutes of interacting. But number one, because I'm the expert first. So you got to know your business. You have to know your craft. You have to know what you're doing. And if you know that, then you know all of the vendors, you know, partners, suppliers, anybody that's in that business, you know what they should know and what they should be doing. The number one thing that I tell everybody is whenever you're looking for somebody for anything and you ask them, you know, do you do this? And they say, yes, I can do that. So there's a huge difference between <laughs> I can do and that's what I do. So I look for people that that's what they do. That's all they do. They're the best at it and they're known for it. So <clears throat> that's really the key because we can all do anything, right? I can do a lot of different things, but there's only a few things that I'm really the best at or an expert at that I would say that's what I do. So that's the main thing right there. And you just look for somebody with a track record that, you know, has the reputation and, you know, you do the back check, check the references, you know, things like that. And again, it just all depends on what it is, but you can go anywhere in the world and, and that that's just, you know, how it works. That's how you do it. But you got to know your stuff first. Are you looking at them as employees and are you looking for workers in some of those situations or are you looking for you know, that take charge, you know, if they are an employee, that entrepreneurial attitude, or do you want someone you know, who's going to take it on, you know, take ownership of that? So and, it, which it is just your depends. For your ventures. Yeah. So it just depends if it's an independent contractor, you know, obviously you want them at the highest level turnkey, you know, that's what they do. If it's an employee, you know, employment situation, and I used to have an operation with a lot of employees and I've had hundreds of employees, um, you know, in my organizations and it depends on what it is you're hiring for. So there's some that you bring on, you know, that you're going to train to do certain things, but the key is understanding the individual, understanding their personality profile. I used to use disc profiling with all my employees. So I knew what their personality bent was and what their best position was going to be. And I call it aces and places. You have to put the right people in the right role um, where they will thrive. So, you know, forget about this, you know, build your weaknesses and, you know, play off your strengths. Uh -uh. You focus 100% on strengths. You, you, you find what somebody's good at and you put them in the right role to thrive and to be the best they can be in that role. So the key as a leader is, you know, as a leader, delegator, motivator, you have to understand the talents, skills, and abilities and limitations, not only of yourself, but of the people around you. So you first understand yourself. What are your limitations? What are you good at? What are you the best at? Then you hire out everything else in an organization, you know, if you're talking about employees, things like that. So, you know, that's how I built organizations was by identifying the right people, putting them in the right roles, and then turning them loose to do their job. So the last thing you want to do is hire Tom Brady to come win Super Bowls and then, you know, micromanage everything he does. Tom Brady's won seven Super Bowls before he ever came to you or six or whatever it was, right? Tampa Bay. You don't tell him how to win a Super Bowl. You put him at quarterback and say, go get it. Win us a Super Bowl right? And you support Tom Brady and you coach Tom Brady and you help motivate him, but you don't tell him how to throw the football. That's what he does. So, you know, same thing with a leader in organization. You understand your people's talents, their limitations, you put the right, you know, butts in the right seat. You let them do their job. You coach them to success. You give them the tools, training systems and support to be successful. You give them clear direction and know in certain terms exactly what's expected and when. You measure that performance, hold it accountable to the goal, you reward good performance and you redirect poor performance. And if there's poor performance, the first person you look at is the leader. Did I give them everything they needed to be successful? Did I tell them exactly what I wanted and when? And, you know, if, if, if you got the result you're looking for, great, you reward that performance. If you didn't, then you got to look back and say, well, if I gave them everything and it still didn't work, do I have the right person in the right role? And then it comes back to the first thing that you hire for. You hire for attitude, right? Skill set you can train attitudes. You can't. So if you have, a, you have two kinds of people, won't do's and can't do's. If they're a can't do, well, you can give them what they need. If they're a won't do, you got to get rid of them because there's just nothing you can do with a won't do. So, you know, that's how that works in a nutshell. And that's uh, an analogy. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's great. So um, how, how do you solidify culture in your business or in the past in your businesses? How do you solidify culture and build that, that great culture of, Hey, let's give us our best foot forward to make sure, make sure we get the best product out there. Well, first of all, the leader sets the pace of the pack, right? So you okay. lead by example, you make it important to you. It'll be important to them. 
you decide what is the culture of your company, what is that going to be, what does it look like, and then you live it out in your organization. So you can't just walk in and say, you know, we're going to be an organization that cares about people, cares about the community, cares about the environment, makes an impact, and then leave. You know, you have to put systems in place and you have to put things in place and talk about and cultivate through action and interaction and taking action that culture. So that's, that's really how that works. You know, it's a deliberate thing of specific steps that you do in order to do that. So for us, you know, the culture was um, the system that I used for management was the culture of the company, you know, the one minute manager system of, of management and leadership. And the key to that is helping people feel good about themselves and what they're doing within the company, within the community as an organization and a team and cultivating that, you know, that, uh, you know, environment of, of leadership and management and community involvement, and then going out and providing opportunities for people to participate. So, you know, we would train on the system, we would talk about the system, we would, you know, ask people, hey, you know, we're going to carve out X amount of budget to support the community. You know, what do you want to do? Whatever our kids, you know, our employees, kids were participating in, we supported those organizations. You know, I was on the board for, you know, all, a lot of organizations in my community, uh, Home Builder Associations, the Parks and Rec, you know, school board, you know, Babe Ruth softball, you know, all those different things. So it's not just talking about it and saying we want to be this. It's putting action to the words and implementing and doing things. You know, we would, we would say, hey, we want to support Habitat for Humanity. Okay, well, let's go lead that charge. And we would build a house every year. We'd go out literally with our hands, we would frame that house every year for Habitat for Humanity. And me as the leader of the company, that would be the one day I would be the grunt and everybody would be telling me what to do. So I'd go out and I'd carry wood all day long. I'd sweep all day long while we were building a house for Habitat for Humanity. And all of my, you know, lead guys, you know, they'd be telling me, go get this, go get that. And they'd be <laughs> bossing me around all day. So it was a lot of fun, you know? So, I mean, that's how you, you know, cultivate the culture of a company. It's, the, it's leadership from the top down. And the organization is from the bottom up. I'm there to serve everybody in that organization. It's not CEO, you know, president, vice president. You know, it's not that pyramid. It's upside down. You know, I have to serve everybody in that organization. So it's leadership from the bottom up. That's, that's how you cultivate a culture of a company that will thrive and grow. And you have people that are, that are committed and take ownership in what you're doing. Great example. I have a question, um, and it's kind of a switch. Uh, I'm looking through your YouTube channel here, and just going through. Uh, looks like you know the first first ten lines of videos. Uh, there's over 25 in crypto. Um, you know, what is your preferred? You know, what is your interest in crypto? Uh, you know, are you just day trading? Are you buying and holding on uh, for dear life, as the saying goes? Um, you know what? You know what? What's your quick take? You know, do you think it's, you know, it is the future? Do you think it's the future with a lot of morphing, um, you know, in relation to real estate uh, and or other ventures? Uh, that you've Yeah, got so it depends on what it is. You know, crypto is a big space. So you have Bitcoin. That's one thing in and of itself that's very different than crypto and, you know, the whole space in and of itself. You have the metaverse, you have NFTs, you have DeFi, um, you, know, you have gaming. So there's a lot of different things that crypto encompasses. So, you know, this is an emerging technology, you know, the whole space is. So, you know, altcoins and cryptocurrency in and of themselves, you know, that's venture capital. So that feeds right into what I am, a serial entrepreneur. It's a very exciting, you know, new space, new technology. You know, we're, we're at the very beginning of what's going to be a major um, force in the economy of the world moving forward. So we're, we're at the very basic beginning stages of what all that's going to be, especially the metaverse and where that's really going and NFTs, you know, things like that. As far as cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, if you talk about Bitcoin and altcoins, specifically tokens, um, you know, right now I'm swing trading, sometimes day trading, just because of where we are in the market cycle um, and where the values of the assets are and where they could potentially go in the near term. So that's kind of what I do there. And, um, you know, I learned about Bitcoin, you know, I don't know, 2015, 2016, when I first heard the word. But, you know, I didn't really pay much attention to it, just kind of watch the pricing and it was just doing this so much and it wasn't really worth a lot. You know, nobody really explained it to me in a way that I could really understand what it was, which is a which was a technology of money, you know, which was really interesting and, and a technology of, of, of value and, and things like that. And what, what we know of it today, it's a risk asset, 
But, um, you know, it just wasn't really explained to me where I could understand it. And then I watched it 2017, 2018 hit $20,000. And it kind of got my attention, like a lot of other people. And it was on CNBC. And then I watched it drop all the way back down almost nothing again. And I was like, ah, you know, I'm not really interested. But I started following it more and more. And then when the March, you know, 2020 bottom happened in the markets and everything, I was looking to make some moves because that's kind of me. I like to come in, you know, with the bottom of things and kind of ride them up. So I made some longer term moves there and wrote them up, you know, to the peak and got out of, you know, everything at the peak the first time, you know, back in, you know, March, April, May, in that time frame before we bottomed out in June, July. And then I made some moves in June, July. And then I've been a little bit more active now because there's so much volatility when a market's going down you know, that you can make some moves in and out. So that's just kind of what I've been doing with that. And a lot of people have been asking me about it. So I started making videos about a year ago. And, you know, I put something out every day, pretty much on crypto and market updates and stuff. And I put something out on real estate and entrepreneurship every day as well. So, but there's a lot of interest, as you can see, you know, the Bitcoin mm -hmm. and crypto videos get a lot more views than anything else right now. Yeah, I'm looking, you know, just doing uh, the base account. Uh, and, you know, not, not really all that bad. Six hours ago, two two point eight thousand views, just on the question: Will a recession start in twenty twenty two? Yeah, uh, you know, twenty hours ago, ten thousand views. Bitcoin, crypto, stock market update: Will the bounce? You know, it, that's, yeah, people you know, are really interested strong. in what's going on. They're tuned in because there is it is a big opportunity, but but a lot of people don't understand the space. They you know they don't know you know anything about it other more than you know it's something you can buy into hold and you know maybe the number goes up and you get rich down the road i mean that's what a lot of people think but right now it's, it's kind of tricky because the market topped recently back in november uh you know it was funny around the thanksgiving table you know a lot of people were talking to me about it and i'm like market's topped you got to get out and you know they were still buying you know they didn't listen and so it's really interesting, whereas a lot of other people were telling their family to get in. I was telling mine to get out. You know, it, uh, it's really interesting. And same thing with markets. And it's all because, again, they're risk assets, you know, a lot of them. And we're going through a deleveraging right now. You know, inflation's a big problem. The Fed has to take action. We've been on this QE path uh, for, you know, years, really since 2008-9. But on steroids since March of 2020, a trillion dollars has been injected into the economy, into the financial markets. And you can see the representation of that liquidity pump, you know, in assets, stock market, cryptos, real estate. So, you know, we are in a, you know, super cycle mega bubble right now that has to unwind a little bit and deleverage. And, um, you know, the Fed is doing the best they can to land that softly versus just explode the whole thing. So we'll see what happens. You know, we're just at the beginning stages of the deleveraging. Definitely. Um... Crypto. And, you know, that's and, not uh, a bad thing. That's not doom and gloom. Oh, yeah, that's just yeah, where we are. Necessity. It yeah. has to occur. We have to come back to normal values, which will create opportunity for growth moving forward. So you, you have to go through these cycles. And it's and I've seen mm -hmm. it, you know, in my career, you know, from the 90s into the mid 2000s into the late, you know, uh, 2000s. I've seen this happen multiple times. You know, the last time we went through something like this was 2018 when the Fed tried to pull back and you know, we had a, a, you know, a big sell off in the markets and things and, you know, they came back in and reverse course. So we'll see how much resolve they have this time and whether they're going to let the markets actually work themselves out or not. It's, it's a big problem. Agreed. How much time have you put into looking into things like DAOs, uh, decentralized uh, autonomous organizations, uh, and, you know, in relation to real estate? You know, do, you, do you see or how quickly do you see those industries merging you know, NFTs, you know, fractional ownership of real estate, uh, you know, DAOs that have been formed, you know, with, with the goal of buying a constitution you know, or a copy of the constitution, I should say. Uh, yeah, you know, DAOs are interesting, entities. you know, um, <laughs> you know, a decentralized autonomous organization, you know, those have a place for certain applications. But when it comes to something like a business or real estate or something like that, it's going to be very difficult because, you know, it's very difficult to make decisions by consensus and that type of a thing. You know, if you're just going to go buy an asset like a constitution, you know, sure, you know, you can just go buy it and do whatever. But then that organization, you know, has to agree on what they're going to do moving forward and how they're going to handle it. So, um, you know, that's that's a difficult thing to do as far as, you know, the tokenization of real estate and real estate NFTs and things like that. There's some experiments right now. There's a company called Proppy 
that is auctioning off a real estate NFT in Miami, a piece of property, a house, single family home. So we'll see how that goes. You know, pretty interesting how that works. Real estate's tricky when you think about tokenizing it or creating NFTs because of just, you know, all of the, you know, real estate's just so unique and different around, you know, around the world with title and, you know, just all these different things. So I think it is the future of the space. You know, the question is, how does that evolve in terms of being able to actually make it happen? So we're, we're again, we're just at the beginning stages of all that. I think eventually all of that, you know, is going to be digitized, tokenized. And really, you know, at the end of the day, what I'm studying and paying the most attention to is, you know, the metaverse, um, NFTs, because, you know, we're already living that, we're already dealing with that. You know, the metaverse is the digitization of everything. Um, so all real estate, all assets eventually will all potentially be tokenized, digitized in terms of ownership uh, and, and how that works. So that's the, the, the areas that I'm paying more attention to. DAO's you know, I don't know that there's a whole lot of future for those things. It's just, it, you know, almost nothing be, works out successfully that is trying to run by consensus. It just doesn't work. Agreed. It's uh, it can definitely get chaotic, uh, especially with that. And uh, you know, I was actually just reading an article about uh, the property uh, being auctioned off uh, there in Miami. Um, and the interesting thing there is they're trying to say they're the first. They're not. You go back as far as if it's either 2016 or 2017, there's been transactions happening uh, where it was either paid for with Ethereum, Bitcoin or something. And I think the biggest thing that it's going to come down to, and each one of them are trying to claim the first, is kind of somewhat the methodology of how they're doing that particular transaction. And I think the biggest thing that's really going to make a world of difference uh, and really, I think, usher in the age of NFTs as you know, the contract of choice, you know, the smart contract of choice is going to be adoption by state and, you know, state and county agencies uh, in regards to the title process and stuff like that, where they ownership, you know, they, they, they find a way to integrate uh, and make that part of the acceptance process and part of the tracking. Instead of having to do a title search, you can, you know, just look it up on the chain, you know, in 10 seconds and boom, you've got it there. Yeah, I mean, blockchain technology in and of itself is a whole different thing. And, you know, eventually, you know, any kind of licenses, any kind of, you know, recordation of title, proof of ownership, you know, all those types of things can reside on a blockchain. There's a lot of potential technology there, but, you know, the, a lot of that's too big for my brain in terms of how to make it work. I just know that it can and that that's, that's where it's going and that's where the future of it is. So, you know, it's like I said, we're just the beginning stages of all this real estate at the end of the day. You know, if you're looking at a general piece of property, you have a, a, a plat, you know, that is recorded and then you have title that's described with meets and bounds. So, you know, and it, what's recorded in a deed book can easily be recorded on a blockchain. You know, from that standpoint, what's interesting about NFT is, you know, the transferability of that and the non-fungibility of it, you know, so that's a whole different conversation in terms of where that's going with real estate. So, you know, we'll see, I think it's the beginning stages. I know there's some DAOs that are trying to do like there's some real estate development DAOs that are trying to buy properties, you know, and, and develop them through a DAO and almost like a fractional ownership kind of thing. But again, you know, those are, you know, when you try to expand that it's very difficult to make work, you know, if you have a limited number of people, you can, it's easier to make it work, but uh, yeah, we'll see where it all goes. It's, it's just, like I said, we're just at the beginning stages of all that. Definitely. And something to look out for, it's already been shown just recently, uh, an article came up on a pot, another podcast I listened to uh, that focuses on, you know, crypto and NFT space specifically. And there are artists who early on were creating uh, NFTs and some hackers have taken advantage of this. And it's uh, a hole that they need to figure out how to rewrite or, you know, account for uh, and or plug in the process is they were, you know, early on uh, new artists, which OpenSea is 100% dependent upon new artists constantly making new stuff and, you know, slowly growing and becoming, you know, well-known artists where uh, people are paying a lot more. But when you put that contract out there for sale on OpenSea, it's, you know, it's there. It, it will always exist unless you find a way to burn that, you know, because essentially you've created, you know, that NFT. You have to burn that NFT almost 
uh, or that contract in some method. And that's the problem they're having because if you modify the price, well, the old one is still there. The original contract, you can't change that. You can delete it, but you can't, you, you know, in, in the process, you have to do something, but you have to, you know, to delete it, you kind of have to burn it, take it off chain, push it into a dead address or something to burn it. There were a lot of people who weren't paying attention to stuff like that. They would lower the price and then, you know, down the road, you know, they may have several works that never sold and then a few that finally sold. And now people start to go back and look at these others. They try to repub, you know, republish new contracts for a piece, you know, a piece of art that might have been an older one that now they're, they've got the traction. They're, they put it out there. There was one for over a half million dollars that someone bought for $3,000 because the contract was there. They went and found the contract. And now people are starting to pay attention to that and they're going back. So that's where it gets risky and stuff that I think needs to be sorted in the long run in regards to real estate. You know, if you put out real estate as an NFT, you know, whether it's a single NFT representing the whole property or fractional ownership, you've got that risk of, you know, if there's still older contracts out there at a significantly lower price, now it's worth a fortune. Say it's traded hands a few times, now it's worth a lot. Someone can still go back and find that old contract and you know it, you know, it, it becomes an issue. Yeah, so that's yeah. That's definitely something you know, they're gonna have to look at. Yeah. And that, that's a little different, you know, with real estate. I mean, you're mm -hmm. talking about chain of title. So that still has to be recorded and respected. And, you know, even if it's a, you know, from an NFT or blockchain standpoint, a little bit different than, you know, what you're talking about, but, um, you know, with it being, uh, you know, a hard asset, you know, that's a little bit different than a JPEG existing, you know, somewhere and with a smart contract. And, that, and that's where the trickiness is currently is, you know, even in that one, you know, happening in Miami. Okay. You know, there was someone discussing it who's been part of several transactions. At the end of the day, right now, you still have to step back to the old technology for the final recording. You know, and apparently right. several of those deals that were supposedly Bitcoin or Ethereum before the deal actually transacted in the office, they had to convert that to fiat, cold hard cash for the actual transaction to happen because the title companies still weren't allowing it to happen in the actual token, uh, you know, in the, of any form. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the NFT space isn't always going to be tied to crypto, you know, so there are platforms out there that where you can buy and sell NFTs just with cash, you know, so it's just an app and, you know, you're creating those images there and you just load dollars and whatever currency you're using and just buy and sell. So as far as, you know, the NFT space, you know, needing crypto in order to function, I think is going to be, you know, a thing that, you know, is a, a thing of the past. It's not really, and again, that's where you, you separate the spaces, altcoins, cryptocurrency, Ethereum tokens from NFT, from, you know, metaverse, those types of things. It's, you know, those things aren't mutually exclusive. Yeah, that, that's, that's a, it's very, very interesting as far as where it's going. And, adaptation how to implement i think i was laughing because uh you're talking about county adaptation the county still use some uses paper they still use paper paper mm -hmm. uh, paper recording and all that stuff so well you know if you do a closing nowadays you know it's still not fully digital you know you still have to actually yeah. sign title so you know you still have to use wet signatures you can't even you know docusign the final document so we're still not fully digitized yet uh, but eventually it's moving that direction. But the problem is not everybody, even in the United States and, you know, um, you know, uh, developed countries have access to technology. Not every citizen does, you know, that not everybody has a smartphone still, yeah. not everybody, you know, has the ability to use that. So until we get to the point to where pretty much everybody does, you can't digitize every single thing. So there's still a bit of that that has to be overcome. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, that's what I'm saying. It's just exciting times where we're at now. And when you look back, I mean, a lot of this has only been the last few years. You know, Bitcoin's only been around 10, 11 years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, think about the iPhone. I mean, how long has that been around? You know, not even 20 years, I don't think, when the iPhone, you know. 2007, I think it was. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, it's really amazing how fast, you know, technology has grown and how far we've come. And like I said, I don't think we can even comprehend where it's all going. I mean, maybe there's somebody out there that can, but I don't even think we know the full capabilities of where all this is going. Yeah, we, we, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's beautiful to see. Like, I like, I like talking to people that seem different stages because you get a different perspective. 
and like for like for me like I'm 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 not even 30 yet I kind of hit the I was on the back end of the industrial and then it turned into cell phones and I'm seeing like all this all this progression super fast so I'm like if the progression over the last 30 years have been so much it's going to be huge when I get to another 30 years when I hit my yeah yeah and you know yeah for you you definitely need to be studying it be on top of it understanding the trends and where it's all going for yep. me, I can ignore it all and be fine the rest of my life, yeah. you know, but, <laughs> you know, anybody who's a millennial, you know, definitely needs to be aware because that's just where it's all going and you have to be able to use it. And I mean, I have, a, you know, I'm only 54, so I'm not even a boomer. A lot of people think I'm a boomer, but um, <laughs> I missed that cut off by three years. But, um, you know, there's a lot of people my age that don't use cell phones, you know, or won't use a computer, you know, my age or even a little bit older. I didn't send my first email myself until like 2001, probably, I think it was, I had a secretary that I would dictate emails to, I didn't even know how to turn the computer on or off. I was afraid to turn it on or off. I didn't know I was going to crash it. So I, I, I started really learning technology 2000, 2001. I didn't have a smartphone until 2012. So I've, you know, gotten up to speed really fast, you know, in my professional career with technology and things. And uh, you know, I'm very good with technology now and, and, you know, can use computers and I'm the guy that everybody goes to for tech support around my family. And, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's interesting, but I like it. I enjoy it. I'm into it. I was always good at games as a kid, video games and all that. So I've always enjoyed, you know, technology. I just, you know, I wish I would have learned a lot more of it earlier and been able to take advantage of more of it earlier versus, you know, I went the physical route using my hands instead of my brain for the most part, you know, building my career and, uh, you know, really ignored a lot of the technology until I had to, and I couldn't ignore it. Yeah, I, I commend you. I commend you for you for you said not getting a cell phone in 2012. Like you're, you've gotten leaps and bounds of uh, information. It's yeah, I bought it, man. I, you know, even text messages. I didn't even want to. I hated that when text first came out. It was the BlackBerry, and then the the flip phone. I had a flip phone, and people were trying to text me, and I just I hated. I want. I'm a guy. I want to talk. You know, I want to communicate. But then I finally, you know, embraced technology and got the smartphone and I've been off to the races ever since. And now, now, yeah, I'm text with the best of them. I so, actually had smartphones uh, all the way back before uh, Windows came out or before uh, Apple came out with them. I recall at that point I had a Windows uh, like slid and had a giant keyboard on there. So yeah, yeah my kids, they like the little I grew up a tech smartphones junkie. and stuff, but you know, and in my company, my construction company, so we were ahead of the curve with technology and I wanted to be. So like all of my uh, superintendents had laptops. I put laptops in their trucks and they had the little key that they could plug into it so they could tap in to the cell signal to use the laptop mm -hmm. in the field and stuff like that. And they all had cell phones and we had mobile installs in our vehicles with pagers. And then, then it went to the cell phones that were, that you could carry around. Then it went to, you know, all of that. So we, we were always trying to embrace technology and use it as much as we could in the company. But me, myself, it, it took a little bit of time to adapt. But like I said, from 2000, 2001 on, uh, I embraced it and just learned it and got good at it and never looked back. So what is a quote that's yours or somebody else's that you resonate with? A quote that's mine or somebody else's that I resonate with? Yes. I guess the biggest thing is you know, one of the, one of the most interesting things is you, you always want to be curious, but um, you don't know what you don't know. And all you know is what you know. And, and I mean, I, I don't know, I could just spit out a ton of them, but um, you know, the biggest thing is to just always be curious, always be learning, always be a seeker of wisdom. I don't even know where those quotes came from, but probably one of the biggest ones is Mark Twain. You know, uh, the most dangerous thing is to think, you know, um, when you don't, you know, or to think you're correct when you're, I can't remember the exact quote, but it's something like that. No, that's good. That's good. So let's, let's talk. I kind of, I kind of curious about, cause like you, you feel like, um, I feel like you've already found like your purpose, your purpose has changed over the years, but I don't, I don't, I don't know if you're, what, what do you foresee in the future? Is like, do you foresee like how big of an impact do you want to make? Like how many millions and millionaires have you made? Is that a personal goal for you? Is it like, do you want to change a multitude of lives? Like what's, what's your impact as far as your, your goal? I don't really think in those terms. So my purpose hasn't really changed. Once, once I embarked in my, on my entrepreneurial journey, it was always to build things. So build people, build buildings, build companies. I'm a builder. And when I impact an individual, then they in turn impact their world and around. So it's just not quantifiable. It's that butterfly effect. So 
uh, you know, I don't have a number like I want to make a million millionaires or I want to do this or that. What I want to do is impact the most people that I can while I'm here so that they can in turn impact their family, their community, the world in their way around them, however they feel that that is what they want to do. So to me, that that's what it is. And it's just one person at a time, one day at a time. And uh, the YouTube channel th that I have now is impacting tens of thousands of people every single day to probably hundreds of thousands. And that's just the business world. And I do a lot of things outside the business world, um, you know, aside from that in the faith community, in the nonprofit world, uh, you, you know, supporting different organizations, doing different things that that are impacting. That's the funny thing is like people don't know my private life, but I do the same thing in my personal life that I do in my business world. Uh, you know, and it's just the way I'm wired. It's what I've always done. And, and I just, you know, that's what fills me. That's my golf. That's my hobby is, you know, impacting the world in different ways outside of business as well as with business. So you mentioned Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, as uh, you know, which is obviously a seminal book for a lot of investors and entrepreneurs. What is your current favorite book or a couple of books uh, that you like to recommend to new entrepreneurs? you know, beyond Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or what is your current favorite? You know, I'd have to look at what I'm reading right now. There's just, there's just so many out there, but the go-to books are anything, you know, I read all of Robert Kiyosaki's books early on. Uh, Think and Grow Rich was a huge one. Power of Positive Thinking is a huge one. Uh, of course, the Bible, you, you know, from a faith standpoint, the, the book of Proverbs is huge. That's probably the best business book in the world out there. Tons of wisdom in that book. That's all very relatable. And a lot of the quotes that you hear will come from that uh, in terms of favorite quotes and things like that. But, um, you know, nothing, you know, I really don't know the titles right now. I'm just reading so many books. I'm one of those guys that always got a bunch of different books going because, I've you know, I've got the Kindle and they're all in there and I'm always, you know, watching YouTube and listening to different things. But um, I'm not even sure what I have open that I'm working on right now. Like you, I've always got at least two or three uh, that I'm in the process between hardcover books and uh, something on uh, Audible at all points in time if I'm in the vehicle traveling. So yeah, and I mean, I've, you know, Simon Sinek, Malcolm Gladwell, you know, all their all their pieces. Um, you know, Zig Ziglar is one of my favorite. Tony Robbins mm -hmm. wrote all his stuff. You know, read Grant Cardone's book. I did an interview with him. You know, on my YouTube channel. Um, you know, read a lot of his stuff. Um, you know, tons. Of, well, Sam Zell. I've read his books. Steve Schwarzman. Uh, read his book recently, Bob Iger. So yeah, I like to read a lot of biographies. I'll tell you, Tillman Fertitta, he's a good one. I'm a restaurant guy, got a restaurant background, read his book. That's phenomenal. Um, you, you know, you start naming them, but more of individuals than anything else. I read business, you know, successful business people in their biographies, read all of Donald, Donald Trump stuff. Don't necessarily agree with him philosophically, but from a business standpoint, in terms of the technical aspects of the business, you know, he's done some pretty phenomenal stuff along the way. Um, so, yeah. Great selections. Oh, well, where can people find you online? I know you have a YouTube channel. What's your YouTube channel called? Do you have any books that you've written yourself? Like kind of where can people find you on, on, on socials? Yeah, I haven't written any books yet. I, I have produced video courses. So those are my books in progress. They're the video audio version of a, that awesome. will eventually become books. But yeah, gregdickerson.com. All my info is there. That's my YouTube channel. Easiest way to find me is gregdickerson.com. Well, um, we appreciate your time. We appreciate what you're doing for the community. And I hope I see your impact through my generation too. So I, I hope I hope to shake hands with the people you've affected as well. So it's kind of amazing to, to really to really talk about impact and what you can what you can even what, what what can even happen from the impact you create. So it's awesome. And we hope you have as much success and your 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 contributors much success as well. Um, we appreciate your time. We appreciate Frank for hopping on here. Um, any final thoughts, Frank? I uh, know I, you know, like you just said, you know, I look forward to watching more of your videos and, uh, you know, so, some of the stuff fits in with stuff that I want my boys, uh, you know, I've got, you know, at home 14, 10 and eight, and they already play rich dad, or what is it? Uh, the cash flow 101 with me. We go out driving for dollars, you know, looking for properties and stuff. So I want to, you know, the same way my sev several of my family members instill that entrepreneurial bug into me. I want that into my kids as well. So. Yeah, that's awesome. That's how my kids grew up. They grew up riding around with me in the car, doing deals, talking to, you know, contractors, clients, customers, vendors every day, just riding around, listening to me, do deals, do business. That's how they learn. Mm -hmm. 
That's amazing. Well, we appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on. Uh, hopefully we might do it again. Who knows? We appreciate you. Have a great day. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Appreciate it.